So I'd like to welcome everyone here today on behalf of Women in Capital Markets and Steichmans. My name is Jennifer Reynolds, and I'm the CEO of Women in Capital Markets. And we are delighted uh, to have the Honorable Nafi Baines here today, the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. It's a pleasure to have you here, and he will be speaking uh, on Bill C-25 and the diversity component uh, specifically uh, within that bill. And so I thought to, um, to kick things off, before I have the minister come up, I, I'm going to set the stage a little bit on um, where do we stand in Canada and what do the numbers look like compared to our global peers and, uh, and, and also with the new compliance plan disclosure that's come into play for uh, public companies, non-venture public companies, you know, how, how has that looked in the first couple of years and how has that uh, developed? So, First of all, if we look at the slide up here, um, you know, this one as a proud Canadian is one that makes me quite sad, actually, because Canada is at the far right in terms of our representation of women at 12% relative to some of our other global peers who are much further ahead on this. And when we think about that, they started working at this a long time ago. Our Complier Explain Disclosure and, and really us thinking about this in Corporate Canada only came about uh, you know, two or three years ago. If you go to places like Norway, they started thinking about this, you know, in the... 2007, 2008 sort of thing. Uh, they went the way of quotas, uh, as did much of Europe uh, in terms of their solution. In the case of the UK and Australia, they chose comply or explain, uh, as we have in Canada. And I will say that, you know, clearly we've seen tremendous progress. Quotas surely have worked in, in these European countries. Uh, but comply or explain has worked in the UK and uh, Australia. We have seen progress. If you think about 2012, uh, the UK, when they first started, was at 12% representation of women on boards, and today they're up at 26%. They've moved their target now up to 33%. If you think of Australia, they were at 8% in 2010, and then we look at them today at 22%. So it certainly can work, uh, but it does. It needs to be very, very intentional. It needs to be on the agenda with corporate world and, and with government as well. And we saw in the UK, in particular, a real push from government as well, to put this on the agenda. So, you know, in Canada, I will say the larger companies have been more focused on this. Uh, the representation in, in companies in the TSX 60 is about 23% today. But the reality is in Canada, our economy is made up much, uh, you know, most of it is smaller companies. So about 70% of the companies publicly listed companies have market caps less than a billion. And if you look at those ones, the representation of women is at about 9%. So we need to think about this in a much broader context, and it can't just be the big companies in Canada focused on this. And, and often we hear, well, you know, it's the oil and gas companies, and it's the mining companies, and they can't make progress. Well, we only need to look at Australia, which is a very uh, resource-focused economy as well, and they've managed to do it too. So, you know, I don't, I don't buy into that particular argument. So when we think about comply or explain, just to quickly talk about, you know, where, where we're at after two years, um, we're at 12%, we're up 1% in terms of last year. 45% uh, of our boards have zero women on them, and another 30% have only one. Our executive suites sadly look much the same with 40% with um, zero women and close to 30 um, with, um, uh, close to 30% with just one. So we need to fix that. Um, that's just broken when I look at that, and we need to see quicker progress and, and to be really intentional about this. The new disclosure, uh, only 21% of companies have a policy when it comes to gender diversity on their boards and in, in senior leadership. So that's not fast enough. It, it's, it's not enough focus, from my perspective, from the corporate world. So I think we really need to think about this. And, you know, the reason that these companies will give so often is that they just couldn't find anyone who merited a board seat. And I think in this room, I'm sure we all know that's just a ridiculous argument. There are many, many women who merit a board seat. And last year, 521 board seats came up uh, on the publicly listed companies, and only 15% were filled by women. So that's such me that, you know, people didn't try too hard. There is a pipeline out there. So we really need to all, as a, as a country, just start dismissing this argument that there's no pipeline of very qualified women for these board seats. Uh, and I think we also need to say it's got to be intentional. It won't happen organically. I think certainly when I graduated from university, we thought this was just going to fix itself as more women graduated from university. But we've been 50% of the graduates for 30 years now. We are abundantly present in middle management, as you can see here, and have been for a couple of decades. It's when we move into those senior roles that we're not seeing the progress that we need to see there. So, you know, I certainly uh, think that with corporate world focused on this, with government focused on this, we can fix this pipeline, we can make this 
this chart looked dramatically different. But I think in 2016, it needs to be something that everybody's thinking about, not just the big companies. It's got to be every corporate boardroom where we're focused on this. And, and, you know, it goes without saying, I hope, certainly in this room, but I think we need to be telling this story more broadly. This isn't about social justice. This is actually about the competitiveness of the Canadian economy. It's about profitability. Um, we just can't have a conversation about innovation uh, and competitiveness without talking about talent and without talking about how we're going to use this, this incredibly diverse talent pool in Canada effectively and give a much broader group access to leadership roles and, and to impacting uh, the economy. So, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, I do feel positive. I think we have, uh, you know, focus on this. I think with the government focusing on this and we can get, you know, a bigger, bigger push into the corporate world. And um, I'm delighted to have Minister Baines here to, to talk about uh, his initiatives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Jennifer, uh, for uh, your leadership and for those kind remarks and uh, those numbers. I'm an accountant by background. And so numbers really illustrate a very important story that you've told. And so thank you very, very much for your leadership and I look forward to working with you. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Steichman Elliott for hosting us today. Uh, greatly appreciated. Beautiful venue. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. As many of you know, and I'm, I suspect I'm preaching to the converted here, this firm has an extraordinary team here in Toronto and around the world. And I want to acknowledge my good friend, someone I've known for many, many years, who's been very supportive, and I'm glad she's here today, Ramadeep Gaiwal, and it's nice to see her as well. She counseled me quite a bit early on in my political career, so it's great to be here at her law firm, which she talks about glowingly. Is that right? Yeah, she nods. <laughs> and, and I also want to single out uh, one of your partners, Samantha Horn, uh, for her extensive work in promoting the advancement of women. And I noticed that for the third year running, the Women's Executive Network named her uh, one of Canada's 100 most powerful women. So that is quite an honor, quite a distinction, uh, and that is very, very impressive. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank Women in Capital Markets for putting together this event today. So it's greatly appreciated because your organization has done so much to empower women in Canada financial service sector. Uh, some very high-profile women are in executive leadership roles. You saw the numbers, just a very few percentage, but within that, there's some very high executive leadership positions within corporate Canada today. Women, women such as Elise Allen, President and CEO of GE Canada. And I single her out because early on in my mandate, when I became the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, I reached out to her proactively to get her advice and counsel. And she's been very, very supportive to me in my development of the innovation agenda, because as you know, GE is a global leader in that area. And she's also playing a leadership role in helping develop public policy through the Growth Council, the initiative put forward by the Minister of Finance. There's also Kathleen Taylor, Chair of the Board of RBC, and she was previously President and CEO of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. And there's Sandra Stewart, President and CEO of HSBC. And I think we as Canadians need to make a point of recognizing these outstanding executives. We don't brag enough about them. We don't acknowledge them. We don't highlight them enough. And that's why I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight three of many outstanding executives that we have in Canada. And these should be household names. These are names that we should, you know, really brag about and be proud about. And I'm here today to discuss how we can empower and promote even more women to become corporate leaders. So the objective is not only to highlight our successes, but what is the roadmap going forward to continue to build on that success? The latest figures and shown, my number here in my remarks says 13%. You've got 12%, so it might be a rounding error. Um, but it says here, the latest figures show that only 13% of all seats on corporate boards in Canada are held by women. And among Canada's largest corporations, that figure goes up too, and it said 23% in the slide as well. So there's a modest uptake when you look at it from that perspective. But I want to share my perspective. As a father of two young girls, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, a nanki who's nine, who, by the way, I just want to say it, I had the opportunity to be with them home this morning, so I flew in late last night to, uh, to make them breakfast and spend some time with them, and that's one of the challenges of this job is, is the amount or the lack of time that I get with them. The nine-year-old is like heaven. She's perfect. She's an angel. She's very thoughtful. She's like me. <laughs> and the six-year-old 
It's a devil in disguise. Uh, and, uh, you know, kidding aside, I really see the world through their eyes, right? And for their sake, I want them to grow up seeing far more women and other underrepresented groups reaching the highest levels of corporate leadership. Because that's the same hope and aspiration my father had for me when he came to Canada. Over 40 years ago, he landed here in Toronto, literally a few dollars in his pocket. And he wanted to build a future, not only for himself, but for our family, and he wanted me to succeed. And I have those same expectations of my girls, and I want them to succeed, and I want to be able to tell them that they can do whatever they want. And I don't want to share these numbers of 13% or 20% with them. I want to be able to say it with much more conviction. So let me explain why this is all so important. And I'm going to take a step back here and present a different lens, and it was highlighted by Jennifer. Economist Harry uh, Markowitz, earned a Nobel Prize uh, in 1952 on his essay on modern portfolio theory. Central to his theory was that the strength of an investment portfolio depended on having a diversity of assets. So very straightforward. We all recognize this. We've all learned this. And to this day, asset managers rely on the Markowitz concept to provide their clients with healthy and reliable returns. Because diversity is powerful, not just in investing, but in so many other aspects of business. More senior executives are realizing that a diverse set of skill sets, perspectives, and backgrounds are crucial in developing good ideas. And this is not only what executives are telling us. Research provides compelling evidence to support this very important proposition. One study has shown that corporate boards made up of members from diverse backgrounds have a 53% higher return on equity than those without. Think of that for a moment. They make 53% more profit on the money shareholders have invested. The business case is very, very compelling. As I said, I'm an accountant, so those numbers really stand out for me. Another study found that firms with diverse leadership teams are 70% more likely to report capturing a new market each year. And that's really important from the Canadian context. Because as a Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development, you know, and responsible for Statistics Canada, I recognize we're a country of 35 million people, and we'll have new data to reflect that, and accurate and reliable quality data to reflect that in February. Uh, our domestic market is not significant enough. We need, if we want to be ambitious and want to succeed globally, we need to be export-oriented, and we need our companies to succeed abroad. So. In order for us as a country to succeed, to have a high quality and standard of living, to create the good quality jobs that we want, we want our companies to be global, to be competitive. And so imagine that if a study found that firms with diverse leadership teams are 70% more likely to report capturing new market share, the potential it has for our economy to grow. And a growing body of research shows that businesses with one or more women on their corporate boards deliver higher average returns on equity and better average growth. So the bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is a strong and compelling business case. It really is good for the bottom line. But I want to take a step back. It's not simply about the bottom line. This position is also based on values. Our government, under the leadership of the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau, believes in the equality of opportunity. This is at the core of who we are and what we believe in and how we make decisions. We believe in a society where everyone has a fair chance to succeed. And that is really the driving force behind what we're going to be talking about today and some of the decisions that we make. Because Canada is at its best when everyone benefits, not just a few. And I've seen this firsthand politically. I have been very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel and represent Canada abroad. Uh, and I can tell you, I talk about my Canadian experience in the point of pride. I remember when I was a teenager, um, I think I was 15 years old at that time, and a young man wanted to join the RCMP, Bald Age Dillon. And he had some difficulties, and there was a lot of pushback, but ultimately common sense prevailed. The rule of law prevailed. Our charter of rights and freedom prevailed, and he was able to serve in the RCMP. And most recently, a young man in Quebec wanted to wear his cure pen to school. And again, that went up to the Supreme Court, and again, he was able to do so. But the point I'm making there is that that's what it means to be Canadian. That sense of belonging is what's so critical to our political philosophy and how we govern. Because at a time when other parts of the world 
are turning inward and questioning the value of diversity, now is the moment for Canada to set an example. This is where we really have a unique opportunity to show leadership. We can show the world that an open and diverse society can bring enormous prosperity that benefits everyone. And that's the key part here as well, because we want to make sure that prosperity and benefit is for the many, not the few. Because Brexit happened, yes, in Europe, and we saw the rhetoric in the U.S., but we're not immune to that. We can't get too smug about that. So any policies we put forward have to be inclusive, have to benefit the many. And our government places a high priority on innovation in our drive to create better jobs and opportunity for all Canadians. Regardless of gender, age, faith, background, orientation, ability, and so forth, we want to see every Canadian work to their full potential. And today, the tools to start a business or create that next mobile app are almost universally available. Take, for example, an Indigenous student with an internet connection can start her own technology company. A retiree with a smartphone can create the newest social media platform. A young intern with an understanding of blockchain can come up with an entirely new way of banking. So innovation requires creativity and fresh thinking. And the best ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. Simply put, the wider the talent pool, the greater the potential for innovation. And that is why we've introduced C25. This bill is something that we tabled in the House of Commons just a few weeks ago. And this bill contains measures to improve diversity on corporate boards and in senior management. It requires corporations to disclose the makeup of their boards and executive ranks. But it also requires companies to disclose their diversity policies to shareholders. So it's not simply about gender. It's really about how do companies promote diversity. Because remember, I talked about the business case. It's very compelling. And as I said, it's not the moral thing to do, but it's also good for the bottom line. Those corporations without diversity policies would need to explain to shareholders why they don't have one. And this bill, bill also requires corporations to provide diversity information to the Director of Corporations Canada, Canada's Federal Corporate Regulator, so that progress can be monitored. And these changes, by the way, are aligned with measures already adopted by most provincial security regulators. So I was speaking to a few regulators as well earlier. And this is something that we want to demonstrate leadership on. And we think we are doing that at the federal level. If passed, the bill would apply to all publicly traded firms incorporated under the Canada Business Corporations Act, regardless of which securities regulators they report. I do want to manage expectations here. That represents about 10% of the registered businesses, 270,000 businesses. But clearly, those are the ones regulated federally, and we want to demonstrate leadership. Two other measures in the bill will also increase diversity in corporate Canada. And one of those measures, and I was talking about this earlier to some of the team members here, requires board members to be elected every year rather than every few years. And this measure will result in more regular turnover of board members, and it will encourage companies to recruit from a wider pool of candidates. So, you know, we often hear this story, oh, you know, we would love to see more diversity. We would love to recruit you, but you've got to wait three years, you know, and, you know, we do this. We have to put together this whole slate of names. There's a bunch of excuses. I've heard them. You've heard them. And a second measure in the bill requires board members to be elected individually rather than as an entire slate. So that deals with that issue as well. An all-or-nothing approach prevents voters from meaningfully exercising their democratic rights and bringing in the board that they want. So the idea is to give shareholders a greater say in how companies govern themselves. So this is really about shareholder democracy as well, and also about what's in the best interest of shareholders. Indeed, shareholders can play a constructive role in holding corporations accountable for considering a broad range of candidates and skill sets, skill sets among their senior leaders. And I'm proud to say that as this bill makes its way through Parliament, it already has received early support from all major parties in the House of Commons. So this is a nonpartisan issue, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a liberal issue, a conservative issue, or a green issue, or an NDP issue. This is a Canadian issue, and it's great that we have the ability to reach out to other political parties. And I worked really hard in advance 
to sit them down, to take them through the change and say, look, we've got to come together and send a very positive signal. We've got to work together on this trial. Our country has an abundance of qualified candidates who reflect the diversity of this country, because we've heard that excuse as well. Oh, we're not sure that, you know, we have the right skill sets or the person with the right skill sets from that diverse background. The Canadian Board Diversity Council publishes an annual list of qualified candidates whom they consider ready for leadership roles on corporate boards. And the Institute of Corporate Directors has a list of more than 3,500 women in its director's register. So there is enormous pool of individuals to select from. And to help companies find the right candidates for boards, the Institute offers a free referral and matching service. So ladies and gentlemen, with Bill C-25, our government aims to develop a new generation of leaders with the skills and experience to drive economic growth through innovation. The bill acknowledges that there is a great value in diversity. This is the Canadian story. And this is a story that I tell time and time again. People say to me, oh, you know, all these changes in the U.S. and Europe and the emerging market, uh, economies in Asia, how does Canada position itself? How is Canada going to succeed going forward? And this is a message that the Prime Minister relays, and this is something that I echo on his behalf. It is going to be our diversity. It's going to be our people. That is our secret sauce. Diversity is our strength, and it is our competitive advantage. That's how we will create better jobs that strengthen the middle class. That's how we will provide better opportunity for all Canadians to participate fully in the economy. And I ask you to lend me your support in the coming months to turn this bill into law. Thank you very much. So I've, I've been told, uh, again, Philip Pru is my press secretary, and I'm afraid of him. He's a very intimidating young man. Uh, that there's an opportunity for a few questions. Uh, and then after the words, uh, there's some media here as well, and I'd be more than glad to do a media scrum afterwards as well. So if, if it's applicable, please, by the way, do continue to eat. If, if you stop, then if you finish, excellent, that's pretty fast. Um, but I'd be more than uh, glad to uh, answer a few questions. And then one minute after that, you can do some closing remarks. Yes. Thanks, Mr. James. That was um, what we got. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, your comments are are uh, very interesting and very important. So thank you for that. And I, you know, I come at this from a couple of different perspectives. I'm one of the advisory board members for Women in Capital Markets, and I also sit on the board of the Canadian Coalition for Good Governance. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time on on different issues like this. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for the government's uh, initiative in this area. I do think that Jennifer raised a, a really interesting point, which is. Um, having a data-driven approach to sh prove out the business case, because I still believe that in the back of many people's minds, um, the view is, is that these initiatives are uh, more socially driven as opposed to actually good for the bottom line. Yep. And um, so my ask uh, and my question for you would be around um, speaking more to those kinds of issues. For example, you know, I see it as uh, the greater the opportunity for a, a diverse range of people in the Canadian marketplace, women, um, non-Caucasians, right, all, all, of the, all of the usual uh, suspects, um, you know, that, that enhances workforce participation. Ultimately, that means uh, that, that more will see role models up in the workforce, potentially not drop out of the workforce. And the more workforce participation we have, the greater our productivity and our prosperity as a country, and as you know, um, we're constantly cited, or constantly, frequently cited as um, being low in terms of productivity relative to other countries. So I guess that, that would be it's a bit of a statement and a bit of a, a question as to how can we get uh, more data in the conversation to really uh, demonstrate how good it is for our economy so that we can get rid of these notions of this being uh, for social good only. Yeah. No, I, I thank you very much for that the thoughtful intervention, and I agree. Uh, there is a social component to it, but there's an economic component to it, and there's a political component to it. And I try to highlight the political and economic component to it as well. But ultimately, the, the case that will prevail, particularly with businesses and corporations, is going to be the economic case. Uh, and I, first of all, agree with you that, that there is enough uh, data out there, I believe, and there is enough information out there that makes the case, but it's not being amplified, and it's not being 
you know, disseminated in a manner that's really resonating with the decision maker. So there's, uh, there's a challenge that we have. And that is why we feel at the government level, the prime minister is trying to set that example. If you recall, when we introduced our cabinet, we had gender parity. Recognizing that wasn't going to solve every single problem, but it sends a very clear signal to the market that we as a government take, uh, want to play a leadership role in this area. So it's easy to preach the business case to corporate Canada, but we also want to do so uh, when it comes to how we select individuals on our board, specifically for the portfolios that I'm responsible for. There's some portfolios like BDC and others that are reasonably doing better off than other ones, and there's some other ones that are not so good. Uh, but overall, our government is around 31% when it comes to, for example, as one aspect of diversity, there's many aspects to it, uh, with respect to the number of women sitting in senior management or board level positions. So we want to show leadership there, uh, and in doing so, we want to make the business case, and that is why I'm the minister as a senior economic portfolio making this case. Yes, I'm very fortunate that women of status of women supports me on this, but I'm the one bringing forward this bill, and I'm putting it through the lens of an economic case. So I, I can tell you right now that, uh, uh, that I'll continue to work with uh, Corporate Canada and to push this agenda, but your role and the leadership in this room is going to be critical. And that was my concluding remark. It's going to require a collective effort. Because ultimately, it's a change in mindset, too, right? There's a cultural aspect to it. We were talking about this earlier. You're still very comfortable with the people you golf with or, you know, who you socialize with or who, who you hang out with. And that network mentality is the reason why you still have people reluctant. It's not that you don't understand the business case. It's just they're outside of the comfort zone. And they don't want to go in an environment where they have three, four people having diverse perspectives and backgrounds challenging the status quo. They like the status quo. It's comfortable. But we as Canadians have to recognize that if we want to compete globally, and the global race is on. Countries are stepping up when it comes to the innovation agenda, the economic agenda. Uh, you know, there's vibrant and growing middle classes in China and India, for example, uh, that are going to occupy a lot of attention, effort, and resources. And if we are to compete globally, uh, we need to make sure that we really uh, make the business case because this will allow us to succeed in those markets. So thank you very much. Mr. Baines, my name is Tanya Van Beeson, and I'm the Executive Director for Catalyst in Canada, which has yes. done tremendous work. <laughs> and, and I am um, happy to be here and partnering with Jennifer, and we're all trying to get together on this issue because I think we all have the same objectives. We have been making the business case since 1962, <laughs> and you could, I suppose you could argue that it's not, you know, we're not getting it out there, but I, I'm not sure that's entirely the case. So I agree with Marcy. I think tying this into innovation is a huge it's a huge part yep. of what you can do and Absolutely. that message because I think the fact that Canada has lagged in innovation for years and years should be a message that all businesses are concerned about. I think certainly, you know, your board members, our board members talk about it all the time. Um, so that linkage is really important and we have research to show that there is a direct correlation between those things. Um, that was just one comment because I like Marcy and I wanted to agree with her. Um, but uh, could you talk a little bit more about the teeth that Bill C-25 will have? So what, 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 is it, what happens if people don't comply? Okay. So uh, two points. Uh, first, on the productivity aspect. You're absolutely right. This is a challenge that we have, uh, this productivity competitive challenge, uh, particularly when we compare ourselves to our U.S. peers. We're still 70% in terms of being as productive. And it's how we really deploy uh, labor and resources, uh, and we do so uh, relatively poorly compared to some of our OECD counterparts. And we've gotten away with it. High commodity prices uh, is partly attributed to that. Uh, you know, more women joined the labor market force over the past few decades has partly to do with that immigration policy. So we've been very fortunate for a variety of other factors to get away with it, a discounted dollar at certain times. All these different elements have allowed us to kind of avoid the productivity discussion. And we've had it, but uh, we really haven't been as exposed as we are right now. And so that is why our government is really committed to the innovation agenda. We made a, a significant fiscal policy, a policy decision during the campaign and saying we were going to inject billions of dollars of infrastructure spending, billions of dollars. Remember, $60 billion was the baseline of the previous government. We ran on a campaign to take that to $120 billion, and we reinforced that by adding another $60 billion and committing that to $180 billion in the fall economic update. So infrastructure and fiscal policy is a big play. But one area that doesn't get a lot of attention, which is the third engine of growth next to monetary policy, is innovation. And what's going to be different this time, there's two different components to it. So I talked to my predecessors, I've talked to many experts 
One is we have to be government-wide. We have to break down the silos. I cannot simply say innovation is something I'm responsible for and not speak to the health minister and not speak to the employment minister and not speak to the immigration minister. So we're really going to break down silos and we're really going to have a government-wide effort. That's the only way I think we can really move the needle on this. The other aspect is the inclusive nature of it. How does it benefit the many? Remember the political challenge that I articulated. So how does it benefit rural and remote regions? How does it benefit women, visible minorities? How does it benefit young people? So we really have to think of it from that dimension. And we are very, very cognizant of that. So those would be the two uh, differentiating factors of how we plan to put policies forward through those lenses. One, it has to break down the silos in government and be government-wide. And secondly, it truly has to be inclusive. It has to benefit the many. Otherwise, come election time, I'll have a tough time. Um, and we've seen the populist movements. We've seen the rhetoric. And we will pay a hard political price and an economic price if we don't get the benefit. And the way that we do that, like you said, we've got to make the case for women, for visible minorities, for people of different backgrounds to be part of that economic prosperity. So that is something that we're very, very sensitive to and we're very mindful of. On, on, the, on the bill itself, the basic premise is really comply and explain. And if a company does not have a diversity policy, they would actually have to explain very clearly of why they don't have one. And what it does is it allows some of their peers in their respective sectors to differentiate themselves. So those companies that have strong diversity policies make the business case and demonstrate better returns uh, can attribute that to that. And other companies will ultimately you know, be shamed to a certain degree. And we've seen some success. Uh, in the UK, I was talking about this. The baseline in 2010 was around 13% of the number of women on, on, on corporate boards. And since they've come up with a similar policy, we've seen a modest increase in five years to doubling that to 26%. We've seen that in Australia as well. Their baseline was around 10 to 11%. Now they're 22%. So there, there is evidence to suggest that there is actual behavioral change associated with this bill, um, uh, with this, sorry, approach. Uh, and that's what we're hoping for. But I'll tell you one thing right now. All options will be on the table come a few years from now. Uh, I, I'm serious about this. So in a few years, if we don't see meaningful progress, and I've said this to Corporate Canada on many occasions, every single option is at the table to reevaluate how we can really move the needle. Because this is kind of their warning. Uh, we will lead by example through our process, but as I said, uh, govern, the government appointments process. And we want Corporate Canada to step up and businesses to step up. And we're giving them some time to do that. Um, so the idea of this policy is that this is not entrenched forever. This is, this is something we're putting forward, and we will review it in a few years if we don't see meaningful progress. Yep. Minister Baines, I'm excellent. Sorry, I stole your pen, by the way. Uh, I'll give it back. <laughs> I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, please. I'm Ekta Mendy from CIBC. Hello. Hello. And I'm also on the steering committees of women in capital markets and the 30% club. So this is a highly relevant topic for all of us. Um, I firstly want to thank you for your leadership on this agenda. And um, exactly to the point you just made, uh, I was also encouraged to read comments uh, that you've made in this vein in the past. Um, I would appreciate your thoughts on two aspects. One, in your opinion, what would be quantitatively meaningful res results and over what period of time? Uh, it's a gray area for a lot of us. Um, and two, what options would you consider at that time should the objective not be met? <laughs> Am I putting you on the spot Absolutely. now? Absolutely. Right. These are tough questions. <laughs> Philip is now in panic mode. <laughs> he, he, he's, he's trying to show grace under fire right there. Um, and even when I, so when we introduced this bill, um, and when I spoke about it in cabinet, and obviously there's cabinet confidentiality, so I can't speak to what was said there, but, uh, but when it was introduced in, in the legislation and I was doing some interviews, these were two specific questions that were asked, and I spoke to them. So on the, on the, uh, the first question is what is quantifiable, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's the ideal target? 50% of our labor market force, 48% to 50% are women. So we cannot afford to leave 50% of our brain power on the sidelines. So the math is very clear. If we generally want to see success in what it looks like, it's got to reflect something like that, give or take a few percentage points. I'm not going to nickel and dime, but generally speaking, if 50% of our workforce, and we saw the, the chart, should be reflected in 50% of the boards, more or less, right? So I would say that is the kind of hope and aspiration target that I have in mind, right? Um, will we achieve that in one or two years now? I don't think so. Uh, but can we see doubling or tripling, and can we see a good trend line? That's what I'm looking for. So that's point one. Still, give me a little later. 
Second is the options. And I wasn't explicit, but quotas, right? I mean, ultimately, you have to say something to that effect uh, to really show people that you're serious. I do believe that this sends a critical message that this is important and we want to see. But that is option is always at the table. And so when I said we're going to look at all options, that's one potential option that's going to be at the table. And I've mentioned that before. Some may agree or disagree, not all woke a, a healthy a conversation and debate. But from my perspective, it's to demonstrate uh, how serious I am about it. It's to demonstrate that there's a strong business case. And it's to demonstrate that we will look at every conceivable option uh, in order to get, make meaningful progress. So I hope that addresses your question. Okay. Thank you kindly. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. Now, thank you. I, I love IOUs from government, um, being in the capital markets area. <laughs> One suggestion I'd have is if you look at the audience here, and, and I'm also on the Advisory Council of Women in Capital Markets, you know, it's 98% women. So my, my, my comment to you is um, um, be vocal, uh, but also do it in a, man, in a room full of men, because hearing that 50%... Um, and, and also having recourse for, you know, if this doesn't work, you got to go to quotas. It is a, it is a, you know, the I don't want to go there, but it's an option that's still at the no. table. Yeah, but I would, I would suggest yeah. doing this in a, in a, and be glad to facilitate that, but very much in a male-oriented environment. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I just, I'm outnumbered at home three to one. So uh, I just, uh, I'm just used to that kind of environment. But it's a very valid point, and that is why I don't hesitate at talking about this. And that's what the Prime Minister doesn't hesitate. So what's really interesting to note is, I'm not demonstrating leadership on this. A whole government is, and the prime minister is. He makes a point when he is abroad talking about diversity specifically, talking about why gender parity was so important and why he built the cabinet and what he was trying to convey. So it's something that uh, we do so not only in a room full of men, but we do so internationally and wherever the opportunity presents itself. So, cool. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Minister Baines. Uh, my name is Roman Lee Farewell. I'm here at Stephen ah. Elliott, and it gives me great pleasure to thank all of you on behalf of the firm for coming here today. It's really our privilege to have hosted this event with Women in Capital Markets. Um, I also want to thank all the people that made this possible on relatively short notice. Um, the logistics, uh, as you can imagine, are extreme, and there's a lot of people in the background who helped out. So thank you. Uh, and it's really a privilege for us um, at Stephen to be hosting this event as we are launching our own uh, initiative related to board diversity. Uh, a few months ago, we started to board, uh, brainstorm. Uh, we have our own women's initiative here at the firm, uh, and it occurred to us that being advisors to boards and executives and having these conversations with boards and executives on a regular basis gave us a really unique vantage point on this issue, and we were in a unique position to be able to try and bridge the gap between um, those who want to be on boards who are interested to know how they could be viable candidates um, but also in our counseling to boards, to businesses and executives um, on uh, these aspects of the bill and proposed changes, but uh, obviously tied into other changes to their businesses as well. So we welcome that. We welcome all the changes that are aimed at reducing challenges and reducing costs for Canadian businesses, but also those that um, reflect our collective social fabric. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and um, uh, please enjoy the rest of your lunch.